Here are the two words I hear most from students when it comes to describing photography. Confusing and frustrating. And they're not wrong. But why is photography like that? You might find this hard to believe, but photography is actually quite simple and even elegant in its execution. Like many things though, you can only see this simplicity when you clear out the clutter. In this video, I'll explain how to reboot your approach to photography by using a four cause approach to the art, which will both simplify and clarify the entire process. In this first of four videos, I'll start by giving you an overview of what the cause are, and then we'll get straight in with the first one, understanding your camera. Let's go. I'm fond of saying that photography isn't difficult, it's vast. And like anything vast that you want to understand, the best way to approach learning it is in small parts, each building on the previous one. This results in a manageable and comprehensive base of knowledge that you then continue to build on later, understanding more of that vast subject. Over the next four videos, we're going to do just that. Break that vast subject of photography down to four cores that you need to get you started on what I hope will be a lifelong journey enjoying the beautiful art of taking photographs. And I do mean that the process of doing it is as much an art as the end result. Photography can be an outlet for your creativity, a meditative space to clear and focus your mind, or simply one of the great lifelong hobbies. It can be all those things at once too, because as I led with, it's vast. And now it's more accessible than ever, thanks to relatively low-cost tech and this sort of tutorial on YouTube, a platform that seemed like science fiction when I was growing up and learning photography. I learned the core concepts of photography in about 20 pages of this fabulous book way back in the late 1970s. Now this is by John Hedgeco and virtually everybody in the world knows John Hedgeco's work, even if they don't realise it. How so, do you ask? Well, if you've ever bought a postage stamp in the UK, the image of the late Queen that's on it is from a photograph taken by him. And the only reason I'm not showing you that famous image now is that it would cost me £380 to licence it. I love you all, of course, but not that much. God bless you, John Hedgeco. Here's what we'll be looking at in this series of videos. Possibly one of the most confusing and unapproachable pieces of electronic hardware on the market today. If a mobile phone was designed like this, you wouldn't use it. But it's not so bad. A modern camera is a cross between a mechanical object and a computer, meaning that approaching it is as much about what you can safely ignore as about knowing what to use. So that's where we'll begin. Oh, not again. Did I hear a groan? Well, don't be so negative, because in truth, these three things are all you need to grant you complete control over your images. We'll look at them one at a time, and I'll show you how simple they are to grasp, and, more excitingly, how simple they are to control. Not only that, but you can both practice and master them without even leaving your home, meaning that when you do, you'll be confident in your ability to get exactly the type of image that you want. Imagine the scene. You're in the middle of a stunningly beautiful landscape, so gorgeous that you don't even know where to point your camera. It really is everything everywhere all at once. And when you look through your tiny viewfinder, everything looks so reduced. So how do you decide where to point your camera? What process do you use for a shot you can be proud of? I'll show you not only how to approach and assess a location, but also how to use the greatest tool a photographer has, your own experience and intuition. This will help you convey a sense of wonder at all that beauty that surrounds you. And it's not really as tall an order as it sounds. Remember, it's building blocks. Understanding the hardware and what you need from it, understanding the results that hardware can produce for you, and then using some simple, classic tools to help you make the shot. Finally, bringing yourself to the party and making that photo about your view of what surrounds you, your interpretation of the world, your eye in the image. All of this while you're freezing your rear end off halfway up a windswept mountain 
or dealing with a crowded, sweltering mass of humanity on a hot summer's day on the streets. Or if you're lucky, watching a sunset in Hawaii. Learn the basics, bring it all home. Let's get started, shall we? We're not actually going to use our cameras today. Instead, we're going to study them as an objet d'art and find out what the parts are and what all those dials, icons, buttons and screens are about. Because trying to make sense of a camera if you're unfamiliar with them can be a very deflating experience the first time you do it. And it's not you. The reason for this sense of deflation is twofold. One, they're an unfriendly design. They're certainly not a pick up and play kind of toy. Two, they're not explained very well in the instructions. Instructions that come with cameras tend to tell you where to find things, but not what they are or what they do. This is because there are so many settings on a modern camera that you'd need a library's worth of books to carefully explain them all. But don't despair, because the good news is that once you understand one camera, you pretty much understand them all. 21st century cameras are modern computerized systems that include some of the most advanced tech on the planet. At the same time, they're still controlled using the basic functions that even the earliest mechanical cameras adhered to. In that way, they're very similar to cars. The difference between a 70s Chevy Camaro and a modern Tesla is considerable, but after a few moments finding the controls in each vehicle, you could drive them. Assuming you can drive, that is. Don't attempt it if you can't. And it's the same with cameras. No one, no all. The concepts remain the same. But just like driving a car, familiarity with the layout, interface, etc. is essential. Once you have it, everything is second nature. You think nothing of getting into a car and driving off somewhere now, but the first few times you did it, I'm sure you thought long and hard. If you're a first time camera owner, think of it like this. You're having to learn a totally new and unfamiliar piece of very advanced equipment. The nearest equivalent that most of us are familiar with would be, as I said earlier, learning to drive a car, something that you usually pay a professional instructor to teach you. And on top of that, the length of time and the amount of practice you put into learning how to drive all contributed to you eventually arriving at a stage where you don't think twice about getting behind the wheel and driving now. It is second nature. A camera isn't entirely different, in the sense that you have to become familiar with the rules of using it, learn new concepts behind its handling, and practice with it until it becomes familiar. Here are three typical camera bodies from three of the top camera manufacturers. Let's see what they've got. I'd advise following along with your own camera in front of you for this part. The place to start, after you've charged your battery of course, is with the on-off switch. The Sony and Nikon have them in an almost identical place. The Canon has it around the mode dial. Your camera may have it elsewhere, but find it. This will call up the camera's operating menu on the back LCD screen. Menu layouts vary by manufacturer and model. The same functions have different names depending on the manufacturer too, as we'll see in a moment. From a design, and therefore a user perspective, this is very confusing. But remember, you don't need to know all cameras, just yours. So for now, find the menu button. We'll talk about the menus themselves later. Most beginners are familiar with this, the mode dial, because it becomes a source of huge annoyance, mocking you with your inability to shift it off full auto. All those unfamiliar icons. As you can see on the Nikon and Sony variants, it's been stripped down to what you actually need on those. But the Canon one is more reflective of what most of us see on what manufacturers label an entry-level camera. So let's start with it. As you can see, it's split into two sections. Let's start with this one. You're all familiar with the fully automatic icon, which just lets the camera do it all for you. These other icons on the dials are what are called scene modes, and all they are is fully automatic modes for specific circumstances. Let me explain what three of them do inside your camera so that you can understand the differences between them. Portraits are usually a half body to tight headshot of a static subject, so shutter speed will not be a priority. Aperture, on the other hand, will be a priority, as it is a desirable quality in portraits to have what is called a shallow depth of field, as is present in this shot. This is achieved by using the lowest aperture number possible. You can see that the subject's eyes are sharp, but the tip of the nose and the ears are blurred. 
This gives both a feeling of depth and puts the focus of attention squarely on the eyes, which is always the starting point for portrait photography. Because of this, the portrait scene mode will look to achieve the best aperture for a shallow depth of field, matched with the best shutter speed to suit the light. It may also engage face recognition, or better yet, eye recognition, and lock focus there. Landscape mode will do the opposite. Because landscapes are vast, the idea is to get as much of it in focus as possible. So the automatic mode will give preference to a greater depth of field by increasing the aperture number. The area of focus will switch from looking at a single aisle face to wide mode to get as much of the image in focus as possible. The shutter speed will again be just enough to stop blur while letting in enough light. Sports mode gives priority to the shutter speed over aperture because it works on the view that you are A, photographing a fast moving object and B, want it to be as sharp as possible. Because of this, it sets a high shutter speed first to freeze movement and then sets the aperture according to the amount of light available. It also works on the notion that you are looking to isolate an individual, so the focusing mode will shift from wide to continuous autofocus. We will look at continuous autofocus in the future, but essentially your focusing system will follow whatever is in the centre of the frame as long as you keep taking shots. As you will have realised from the description, it's only a few elements that change, focusing area, aperture, shutter speed and ISO. Scene modes are fine and are like a step between full auto and more manual control. They at least get you used to the idea of changing settings on your camera for different styles of photography. But they can still get it wrong and they still choose for you. So while you may use them for a while to gain confidence, I guarantee that you'll soon want more. And that's where the other part of the dial comes in. MASP, or on the Canon, M, A, V, T, V and P refer to manual control, aperture priority, shutter priority and program mode, or ISO priority to me and you. When you become familiar with your camera, you'll alternate between A, S and M most often. When I described the scene modes, I mentioned how they decide the priority, aperture, shutter speed, area of focus, based on the type of shot being taken. A, S and P are semi-automatic modes. They allow you to choose a value for one characteristic and then the camera takes care of the rest. In aperture priority mode, you may decide you want only a specific part of the image in focus or all of it. You choose the aperture and the camera will do the rest. In shutter priority mode, you decide the level of movement in the frame. Freeze time or introduce blur? It depends on the shot, but you only have to decide which and set the shutter speed to achieve the desired result. These two modes and manual mode are where most hobbyist to pro photographers live. We will explore those and program mode in depth in the next video, but these are what give you the foundations of creative control of your images. Let's move on to the myriad of buttons that clutter up your camera body. Nice and simple, these two. These are the buttons to review your photos, playback videos you've recorded, and bin the ones you don't want. A lot of photographers swear blind by the use of this button to quickly brighten or darken their photos while they're looking through the viewfinder. You press it and then turn a dial, and you'll see a little slider with zero in the center that goes up to plus two and down to minus two, which brightens or darkens your image. That's all this does, and I never ever use it, mostly because it doesn't automatically reset to zero between shots. I'll talk about it more in a future video, but for now, you can safely ignore it. A far more useful button. This allows you to choose how many photographs your camera takes when you press the button. Taking a photo of a person or a building, a single shot will probably do it. A fast moving performer, Press this button and select fast burst mode and the camera will take 6, 11 or more shots per second to capture the perfect moment. You decide what mode is best for what you are photographing. More of this later. AF on simply means autofocus on. On most cameras it is on by default and is what the majority of photographers use. You rarely turn autofocus off. 
This probably accounts for why the AF button is one of the most reprogrammed buttons on a camera. Yes, if the functions of all those buttons on your camera wasn't hard enough to learn, you can change virtually every single one of them to perform different functions if you wish. We won't for now, but will later. It's actually one of the better things about modern cameras. As a beginner, I would advise setting your ISO to auto. The rule of thumb with ISO is that the lowest number gives you the best picture quality. And by setting your ISO to auto, the camera will always set the ISO to the lowest number it can by default. We will look at this more closely in the next video, but for now, set it to auto and don't worry about it. For newcomers and even a lot of pro photographers, camera menus are a pain, mostly because there's so much going on in them and the structure can be quite baffling. Some run to over 70 pages. However, modern cameras have three distinct advantages to counter this problem. As we have already seen, there are several buttons clearly labelled and given over to key tasks on the camera body, so you don't have to go into the menus to access them. All cameras come with a few extra buttons that you can add other shortcuts to, to have quick access to a specific function that you choose. My favourite, the function button. The function button goes by different names depending on the manufacturer, as you can see here, but they all do the same thing. They allow you to set up a group of functions under one menu so that instead of having to wade through pages and pages on the back of your camera's screen, you can press the function button and have quick access to the menus of your choice. I'm using a Sony camera so your menus may look different, but for a beginner there are only one or two things to check in here. As you can see here, on the first tab I've set my image size to its largest to get the highest image quality. My aspect ratio is 3 to 2, the standard for photographs, and I would recommend you to start with RAW and JPEG selected. The file format at the bottom of the screen refers to the video format, as you can tell by the icon, and I've left this at its default. On the second screen, you can see that there are more settings, but I'm not going to worry about those or any of the settings on the other pages. The reason being that you can change most of these settings from outside the menu. For example, the drive mode settings that you see here are already mapped to buttons on the camera body. And as you flip through the remaining screens, you'll find that this is frequently the case. As a rule of thumb, if it isn't mapped to the camera body in some way by default, it isn't a setting that you need to change for general use. We'll make everything that you need accessible for 99% of your photography needs, either through the buttons on the camera body or through the function menu. Just like when you learn to drive a car, the key to happiness with your camera is knowing what functions you need to have access to, what functions you can safely ignore, and then practicing to become familiar with your camera's layout. It's as much muscle memory as anything else. We've looked at the most important buttons on your camera's body, but let's get familiar with a function button and set a couple of things up on the menu for quick access that might not be immediately accessible from your camera's buttons. Because all camera bodies vary, you may already have some of these functions assigned to a button, but it doesn't matter. The point of this exercise is to familiarise you with the function button, the function menu, and get you used to setting it up how you like. The first thing to do is find this setting in your camera's menu. It's function menu set on my camera, but depending on what your manufacturer calls their function, it will be labelled differently, so hunt it out. My function menu has two lines of six buttons. As you can see, I can assign 12 different functions for quick access under this one menu. The menu asks you to select a button, and when you do, it opens up a range of features that can be assigned to it. There will already be features assigned by the manufacturer to these buttons, but here's the ones I keep to hand. I'm going to give you an example of how I use each of these modes too, so you can see the reason for keeping them all ready for quick access. Why? to change between single and burst mode shooting at live events. Focus mode, why? When I switch between taking just a single shot or a series of fast burst shots, the focusing has to change from single to continuous for the best results. Focus area, why? For most static subject shooting, I leave this on center because I like to pick the focusing point, a person's eye, a specific point in the landscape, for example. 
but this mode does not work with a fast moving subject because they move throughout the frame quickly. So for this, you switch to wide mode. That way, the camera makes use of all the focusing points that are spread across your sensor, not just the central ones. Metering mode, why? This determines where the camera takes its light reading from. Usually, you want the entire image well lit, so this spends 99% of its life in multi-mode. Occasionally though, you will only want to take your light reading from a specific part of the image. You are then shaping with light, a concept we'll talk about in the future. So you take your light reading from only a specific area to ensure that that area is correctly exposed. Like this waterfall, for instance. To stop it being overblown with a long exposure, I was only concerned with getting its exposure correct. I wanted the rest of the image to fall into darkness, which is why I took the reading only from this one specific bright point, the water. White balance. This is not so crucial when you shoot in RAW, because you can change the white balance in post editing, but as with most things, it's better to get these things right in camera if you can. I do keep it mostly in auto mode, but change it to manual for when I shoot these videos. These are the only settings that I keep there permanently, even though some are also in buttons on the camera body. Why do I do that? Because sometimes you want to change all these settings in one go, so it's easier to do it from this single screen rather than jumping between all the individual buttons on the camera's body and then going into the menu for others. Next, let's have a look at the feature you'll use most, the dials. For this exercise, simply move the dial on top of your camera to the M position. The settings that you want the quickest access to on a camera are shutter speed, aperture, and to a lesser extent, ISO. With the latter, as we've already seen, there is a dedicated button to allow you to quickly change the ISO. If you haven't done already, set it to auto. Aperture and shutter speed are controlled by using the dial or dials on your camera. Depending on your specific model, you will have one, two or more dials on your camera body. If you have more than one dial, the camera will be configured so that one dial changes the aperture while another changes the shutter speed. If you have a single dial, it toggles between aperture and shutter speed control. To switch from one to the other, you simply press a button on your camera. If you only have the one dial, look in your instruction manual to confirm which button you press to toggle between both settings. Or if you have two dials, simply turn them and see which dial changes which value. Aperture is measured in f-stops and typically ranges from 1.2 to 32. Shutter speed is measured in fractions of a second and appears as a fraction in your LCD screen. So, to begin, make sure you know how to change the aperture, the shutter speed and the ISO on your camera. Practice with those dials and buttons, then get used to using them while you hold the camera up to your eye. As I said earlier, it's muscle memory as much as anything else. In the next video, we'll move on to using those functions to control how your image looks, and I guarantee you'll be amazed at how simple and quick it actually is to master. I'm available on all the usual social media platforms, and you can follow me there if you wish to. You can visit my website for blogs, information about me, and to see my photographs. Because once again, if you're going to take photographic advice from anybody, make sure they take good photos. I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.